Amen. Amen. In Matthew chapter 6, uh, many of you are familiar with the fact that Jesus is well into what many people refer to as the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount begins in Matthew chapter 5, goes through Matthew chapter 7. So while we, when we're in Matthew 6, we are full on into this sermon. And it's an interesting uh, place and circumstance within the Gospels because in this instance, Jesus is talking to a great crowd of people, not just his disciples, because we have many instances where he's just simply having conversations with his disciples, having conversations with Pharisees and Sadducees and things like that. But in this particular case, he's having a conversation with a large crowd of people. And one of the things that he's saying to this crowd of people at the end of chapter six is, do not worry. Do not worry. He then says, for tomorrow has enough worry of its own. Right? And then he says this, each day has enough trouble of its own. The NIV says it this way, therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. I find it interesting that A third of the Godhead, the one of whom John writes in the beginning of the Gospel of John, in the beginning there was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In him all things were made, without him nothing was made. That this individual is talking about the natural trouble of a day. Um. It occurs to me that, and and I shared a little bit this last week, there are troubles that come in spite of the fact that we serve a God who is all-powerful, all-knowing, and is all-present, omnipresent. That in spite of the fact that we serve a God who is in control of all situations and circumstances, we still have troubles. In fact, though, God utilizes those troubles for those of us who believe. He utilizes those troubles often for our protection and for our perfection. That God utilizes troubles, things that we deem as trouble. Let's be clear. Things that we deem as trouble, like when you applied for the promotion and you didn't get it. You deem that as trouble But God utilizes those things often for our protection. Because you know that there are times where you could apply for a promotion, not get it, somebody else gets it, then a year later they get laid off, but you still got a job. And you didn't realize that it was God's protection until afterward, sometime. And we know that God will end relationships for us that we probably should have never been in so that we don't invest too much time and effort and heartache and pain into those relationships only to be hurt more severely in the end than when we were when he took the relationship and ended it. See, so there are troubles that the Lord uses to protect, and then there are troubles that the Lord, that the Lord uses to perfect. So there are times where the Lord will allow and orchestrate what we would see as troubles to help form and fashion our character. So that in the end, we would come out looking like what he desires. For the scripture says that he desires that we be conformed to the image of his son. And for us, in a world that is tainted by sin, it often requires trials for us to get to a different place in our character. I I know that some of you can attest to the fact that you've had great revelations about some issues you've had when you were going through something that was difficult. I know that you've experienced, sometimes even the loss of a loved one can cause you to reflect on some things in yourself where God is trying to perfect you and change you for your good. So Jesus is, is, is saying to this crowd of people, do not worry for each day has worries of its own. In fact, each day has troubles of its own. The context of what Jesus is saying is the fact of the matter that you should not worry. That's the context. Don't worry. But there's another truth that is in that context that we need to understand clearly this morning. That truth is, if tomorrow 
has enough trouble of its own, don't add self-made trouble to the problems that already are going to exist on their own. Oh, do, you, do you see that? Do you see that? This is what he's saying. He's saying, look, he's saying, don't, don't worry. Therefore, don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Right? So don't worry. He says each day has enough trouble. Enough. That term enough means tomorrow's trouble doesn't need the trouble that you're going to add to it by worrying. So, uh, but I need you to see this truth, though, more broadly, because worry is not the only trouble that we can add to the troubles that life already brings. Oh, he's got quiet in there. <laughs> Anytime that I decide to engage in self-sabotaging behavior, I potentially add trouble to the trouble that life already brings. Oh. Anytime that I make decisions that have a high propensity for negative outcome, I add potential trouble to the troubles that the world already brings. I think we could say it this way and make it extremely plain. Anytime I make decisions to live life contrary to how the designer of life specifies and designates I add additional potential for trouble on top of the trouble that life already brings. Yeah. 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 See, I, I, I need you to see this. And, and I, and I want to say to you, I, I know that God can take a mess you made and turn it into a miracle. Yeah. I'm living proof. <laughs> That God can take a mess you made, (laughs) turn that mess into a miracle. I've seen it. I've been through it. I've done it. But I've also shared with you that as much as many of us want to see and would love to see a miracle, many of us don't want to be in a position where you need one. Yes, you're right. Yes, amen. Amen. That's right. I would love to see all kinds of miracles, but I don't want to be in certain positions where I need to see miracles. And, and, and so I want you to understand that this is really what we're talking about as we're talking about um, what Proverbs is, is saying to us. Um, think about what I was saying to you last week, that God says through the prophet Jeremiah in Jeremiah 29, 11, he says to the prophet Jeremiah, for I know the plans I have for you. I just need to, to show this to you. Notice he says, for I know. The plans that connotes that we don't know for I know the plans I have for you. Right. And he says that because what he's really saying is I know them. You don't. Mm -hmm. He's also saying, though, I can't share the specifics with you. What I can tell you is the nature of those plans, which is why he then says plans to prosper you and not to harm you plans to give you a hope and a future. I know the plans. You don't know them. I can't share all the specifics with you. Because if I did share all the specifics with you, you'd be messed up. If I did share all the specifics with you, you might not go where I want you to go. (laughs) If I did share the specifics with you, Jeff, you might not leave and go to Georgia. If I did share the specifics with you, you might not go where I want you to go. But I need you to understand at least my intentions and the nature of my plans. They are to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you hope. And a future. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's good. That's good. So we, we have an ability to add trouble to already existing trouble by making poor decisions. Yeah. I got what well, I got. <laughs> yeah. Let's see, I got, I got a real section right up here. Just, I got honesty right here. Oh, okay. Let's see. Raise your hand if you have ever made a decision that was a bad decision and the outcome was negative. Look at that. Look at that. Jesus. All right. I just want to, I just want to get us all to a place of honesty. Right? We, we have the ability to do that. 
So remember, our question is, if God has in mind for us to live a life that is prosperous, free of harm, that is hopeful and whose future is good, how can he do that in the midst of the decisions that we make? Because we make decisions all the time. And some of those decisions are not good. (laughs) See? And and this is really what what, what the book of Proverbs Proverbs is about. It's how do we calibrate our lives to be lined up in a way to where the future that God has in mind becomes the life that we live in our reality. This This is really the essential nature of the book of Proverbs. How you can have the life... That God desires for you to have. Prosperous, without harm, hopeful, and with a good future. So we started last week looking at Proverbs chapter chapter 3, verse number 1. And we see this call where it says, My son, do not forget my teaching, but keep my commands in your heart, for they will prolong your life many years and bring you peace and prosperity. Peace and prosperity. And prosperity prolong your life many years and bring you pre peace and prosperity when I was done last week My wife took me in the back and she says Ron, you know what? She says you mentioned something about life of the body and life in the body, but you didn't explain what that was I didn't understand it and I said, oh, okay. I understand This scripture is addressing life of the body and life in the body. It's addressing goodness toward each of those aspects of life. Life of the body is the life you are breathing. It is the literal life within your body that gives you animation. And this passage of scripture says that if you will obey, that if you'll listen to what God is saying, that you'll live a long life. Can you imagine? All right, this passage of scripture is not giving us details about how to eat vegetables. And how to exercise. This passage of scripture is just simply saying, look, if you listen to my teaching and my commands, you'll put them in your heart. Make them the very root of how you think and perceive. If you'll do that, then I will address life in the body, the life of the body rather, and give you long life. Then it addresses life in the body. That is the life you lead every day. It is the life you want to lead. It is your relationships. It is your finances. It is your life that you live. And this addresses that in this passage where he's saying, look, not only will he prolong your life many years, but bring you peace and prosperity. This passage, which truly summarizes everything that the wisdom book of Proverbs is saying to us, it's saying that if we'll obey God in this respect, That he will address life of the body, give us long life, and life in the body, peace and prosperity. (laughs) So if we're asking ourselves, well, how can God ensure that what he desires for us a life that's prosperous, without harm, that has hope and a future, how can he guarantee, how does he do that? How can he guarantee that this is where our life ends up in face of the fact that we make our own decisions? It is through his commands, through his directions, through his instructions. This is how he can guarantee that we ultimately lead the life that he desires for us to live. I know. I, I heard you. She said, you make it sound so easy. I know. We're, when we're getting there, we're getting there. Um, let me take you to chapter or verse number three. It's, it's funny because, um, my God, just give me, give me the first letter. First what? No, no, no. First letter, right, right, right behind in the blue. I said the first letter, Anivia. (laughs) Anivia makes the perfect transition where we're going. Look Look at verse number three. She says, you make it sound so easy. 
It says, let love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Then you will win favor and a good name in the sight of God. Look at this. And man. Oh, hallelujah. First, I want to let you know that that term love that the NIV uh, the word love that the NIV has translated from the, from the Hebrew into love is a word that in Hebrew actually means loving kindness. I, I need to be clear about what that is because we say I love you to people all the time, but the original Hebrew word meaning loving kindness implies more than just something you would do with words. In fact, loving kindness is an actual display of love. Loving kindness is the kind of love that we see when Jesus was asked by the Pharisee, well, who's my neighbor? And then Jesus proceeds to talk about the good Samaritan. He begins to talk about a man who was beaten and robbed, who a priest walked by and ignored, who a Levite, who, come, who the family of priests come from, walked by and ignored, but who a Samaritan who Jews see as lower than dogs came by and whipped out oil and wine to help heal the wounds, who put this man on top of the donkey and walked while the man rode his donkey, and who went to an inn, came out of pocket with his own money, and put this man up and said to the innkeeper, if there is more fee left over when this gentleman recovers, I'll pay it. Remember, love, real love, as displayed by Jesus, is something you do for the benefit of someone else at your own expense. Love is a sacrificial thing that's done, and it is a display that doesn't happen with just your mouth, but it happens in your deeds. Loving kindness. So let loving kindness and faithfulness never leave you. The King James uses the word truth instead of faithfulness. I want you to know that I looked at 29 versions of the Bible. 21 of the 29 versions use the word truth instead of faithfulness. The reason why is because the original Greek word that is translated there actually means um, um, divine truth or divine instruction. So what it's really saying is let loving kindness and divine instruction never leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablets of your heart. Now, it's important for you guys to understand what this bind them around your neck really means. Because that is crucial. We see it in the scriptures over and over again. It is the neck that is utilized to control direction particularly when you're dealing with an animal. So, you know, if you're going to ox a yoke to, to, I mean, if you're going to put a yoke on an ox so that you can till your field, you're putting something around the ox's neck so that you can control where he goes. You put a rein with a bit around the, around the mouth of a horse or a donkey so that you can control their neck and tell them which way to go. I've shared this with you all the time that when God says stiff-necked people, as he often refers to the children of Israel, what he's saying to them is, I cannot control the direction you go in this is unfortunate because it is by the neck that we are controlled this passage is saying let loving kindness and divine truth or divine instruction be the thing that guides you but the scary thing is for that statement to be made there is the implication that other things are bound around our neck and guide us This is why the instruction is given because there is, there is the potential that something else or other things are bound around our neck and are guiding us. Yeah. Do you remember last week I was talking about how many of us are shattered but functional? Yeah. That there are circumstances, circumstances of life that have literally shattered us, but we are functional. We work through those through being shattered and we raise families and children through being shattered we're participating in marriages as shattered people we're serving in ministry as shattered people there are many of us who are shattered but functional but there are some challenges that come with being shattered uh, number one I, I need you to recognize this for something to be shattered 
It consists of just a number of cracks. You've seen a shattered windshield. It's a number of cracks. And what those numbers of cracks have done is they have weakened the structural integrity of the windshield. When you see that windshield, it's bowed. It can go in and out. If you, if you ever touch one, you can push it in and out because its structural integrity is significantly weakened. And so for many of us, circumstances of life have shattered us and our structural integrity is weak. The other thing that shatters, that shatters do as you have this series of cracks is it makes it difficult to see. You can't drive. Or you can try to drive with a shattered windshield, but it makes it really hard to see. And for many of us, we, have, we, have, we are shattered people and we're functional, but because we're shattered, it's difficult to see. Many of us have perspectives that are off. Some of us are shattered and have perspectives of ourselves that are off. Some of us are shattered and have perspectives of others that are off, including God. And some of us are shattered and have a combination of the two. Yeah. As a result, we'll live weak with poor perspective about ourselves, about others, and about our God. And when our structural integrity is weakened and we have an inability to have right perspective, we are a breeding ground for insecurity and fear. Yes. Amen. Amen. <sighs> um, it may, it may fit. It, it, you may find it better this way. We are a breeding ground for insecurity and fear, but insecurity and fear never ride alone. They have byproducts. Yeah. Distrust, the inability to trust people. Mm. Isolationism, the desire to not be around people. Yeah. And anger being easily offended. Yeah. So listen to what I'm saying to you. So some of us have these things bound around our neck yeah. and they guide us. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm. <sighs> uh, the very next verse, verse number four, tells us what happens when we are guided by these things, because if we're guided by anything other than loving kindness and divine instruction, we miss out on verse number four. Verse number four says, then you'll win favor and a good name in the sight of God and man. So I want you to think about this, beloved. Listen, some of you, some of you can maybe identify with what I'm talking about. Some of you have experienced circumstances in your life that have shattered you, that have weakened your structural integrity, weakened your ability to rightly have perspective of yourself, of others, even of God. As a result, you see that there are some elements of distrust in your life. You don't trust people. Elements of isolation where you don't necessarily want to be around people. Elements of anger where you are easily offended. But think about the end result when those things direct and guide you. If those things are guiding your neck, you have those things bound around you. They never end with an outcome that is favorable. That's right. That's right. When your actions are guided by insecurity, fear, distrust, anger, isolationism. Whenever those things are the things that guide your responses to the people around you or to your God, the outcome is never good. Yet, many of us find it difficult to get out of that cycle. We find it hard to break that cycle because we've been doing it for so long. We have been shattered but functional for a long time. And these things just seem like this is how I am. Yes. <sighs> so the Lord is directing us here because Anivia was saying, you make it sound so easy. It's not necessarily easy, but it's doable. Yeah. It's not easy, 
but it's doable. And it begins with, number one, allowing loving kindness to be a guide for you. Um, remember this thing right here says, then you will find favor. Verse number four, then you find favor with good, with, in a good name in the sight of God and man. Do you know it's easy for us or easier for us to believe that we can find favor and a good name with God more so than people because people are fickle. Right? It's people are inconsistent, man. And, and, you know, there are some people who, if you have to deal with them regularly, there are days where you don't know if it's a good day for them or a bad day for them. Do you know people like that? Where it's, it's, you never know. Like, you wake up, you're like, all right, who, who do I get today, right? Like, are you, are you good today or are you not good today? How's this going to roll? People who you go to work with and you're just like, mm, are they in a good mood today or are they in a bad? Like, how, who, who are they today? People are fickled. They're not like God. They're not constant and consistent like God, always good, all light. They're not like that. People are different. But listen to me. I need you to understand this. While you'll never be able to make everybody like you, you can always certainly make it so that no one can honestly say anything bad about you. Right? Right? Favor with God and man. Remember when we were talking about Daniel and I was saying to you that Daniel was gaining this favor in the eyes of the king and the other chiefs over all the satraps were mad because the king was about to make Daniel second in charge of the kingdom. And so they plotted to see if they could find some area of his life where they could speak against him. But because Daniel had within him a spirit of excellence, the scriptures tell us they could find nothing. So the only thing they could do was bring an accusation against how faithfully he served his God. They didn't like him, but they couldn't find anything bad to say about him. Loving kindness is the kind of thing where even when people don't like you, if you show loving kindness to them, they can't say nothing bad about you. And, And if you will allow divine instruction to guide how you live, they will respect how you live. And anything they say about you will be a lie. They will not be able to honestly say anything bad about you. Now, (laughs) I know we live in a world where people will lie on you. (laughs) Not only that, but we know that we also live in a time and in a world where they speak of good as evil and evil as good. But my point is, before God's eyes, no one will be able to say anything bad about you. If you'll let loving kindness and divine instruction be the thing that guides you. And then then Solomon is saying, and then you write it on the tablets of your heart. And we've been talking about this for a long time. The heart is really your mind. It is the root of your thoughts and your emotions. It is where you let the, the very root of all that you think and believe rest. If you'll let loving kindness, loving kindness means that not just that you'll say nice things to people at your work, but you do nice things to people at work, even the people who drive you crazy, even the people who you know are talking about you behind your back. Oh, hallelujah. That's a tough one. I share, I, <laughs> Mary was like still working on that faster. So I, I shared with you guys how when, when I was teaching, I used to work with a teacher, and I, and I know that she just had all kind of bad things to say about me. But man, I'm telling you, I would, I would pray for her in the morning, and I would pray blessing on her. And, and you know, I, and trust me, I know that we have examples from David of people who pray, and they're like, all right, strike their teeth, break their teeth, Lord. I know we have that, but that, this is not where I was, right? I'm literally praying for this person's life to go well, praying for their unborn children, praying for the prosperity of her family, her husband, praying for their household, praying that they would do well and be blessed. It doesn't matter to me. See, remember I was sharing this with you. Strong character is when your character is not moved by other people. When your character can remain strong in spite of what other people do you have strong character you can exhibit loving kindness when you have strong character 
you can ensure that what you do in response to what other people do is still always in line with what God expects, particularly as it pertains to loving kindness, being able to actually display love, not just saying it, being able to do something about it. That is crucial. In addition to allowing God's divine instruction, and we're just getting into the beginning of this, but allowing God's divine instruction to guide your life. Now, there's a lot when we look at God's divine instruction. I mean, if we were looking at the Hebrew Bible, we'd be looking at 600 and some odd laws, over 620 laws. When we, when we look just in the New Testament scriptures, just following the Holy Spirit at times can be difficult because sometimes you don't even know where the Spirit is leading. Sometimes you know where the Spirit is leading, but you're not feeling where the Spirit is leading. You're yeah. right. You know what the Holy Spirit is saying. You're just not feeling it. Just, and I know that there are many of us in this room who the Holy Spirit has said something and you were like, mm, no thanks. Like, I'm not, I'm not doing that today, Holy Spirit. Like, oh, I feel you. Like, I know that you're there. I just don't want to do that today. Like, <sighs> I know that we have these times. Um, but if we will allow divine instruction to guide us, then we can have this life that God has in mind for us in heaven. And what he has in mind for us, this life that is prosperous, this life that is without harm, this life that, that is hopeful and has a good future, this life can be our life. Amen. And I'm telling you, you want that. Yes. Beloved, listen to me. You want that. In fact, it's got to be one of the things that becomes a motivating factor for you when we think about how hard it might be to do this, what we have to recognize is that the life we want to live, the life we want is on the other side of this. Hmm. Oh, I wasn't going to share this with you, but let me, let me share it with you because, uh, okay. Uh, all right. I wasn't going to let this out, but let me let it out. All right. Oh, my gosh. Um, in the very beginning, as God created the heavens and the earth, he created an environment of absolute perfection. He created an environment of absolute perfection. Perfection. He then created Adam and Eve, placed them within an environment of perfection. I believe that we have an innate coding within our DNA a desire for perfection. It comes from the fact that Adam and Eve were created in the context of perfection. This is why we have expectations for positive outcomes of everything, though we, live, though we know we live in an imperfect world. Yes. Yes. We know we live in an imperfect world, but we have expectations of good for everything we do. We are motivated by the desired outcomes that we have in our minds. I believe that those outcomes are related to the fact that we were created in the context of perfection. So we have a desire to have perfection. However, we live in a fallen and a broken world. Because of it, perfection eludes us. We don't always have perfect marriages. And we don't always have perfect children. We don't always have perfect careers. We don't always lead perfect lives. In fact, our lives are sometimes subject, I was talking about this last week, as children, our lives are subject to the decisions of the adults in our lives. And sometimes their decisions are not good and imperfection comes into our life through them. I mean, there are just so many ways that we recognize that we live within imperfection, but we have this innate desire for perfection. We expect it in everything we do and we are disappointed regularly. Yet, what the, yet the promise of Proverbs, the promise of Proverbs is what we should be reaching for. This should be a motivating factor for us to overcome the lack of perfection around us. Because through Proverbs, there are certain things that God is promising will be well and can be well. Beloved, we would not have a life that's not filled with trouble, but we can have a life that has less trouble because we're not adding on to the trouble that life already brings. Amen. 
So when we talk about really getting into it, right, we talk about really how we do that. We're going to begin next week. We're talking about exactly how we do that because our text begins to give us more instruction on how we reach what it promises in the first verses as it promises this long life with prosperity and peace. These next verses will lead us to how we get there. Bow your heads with me. Designers well.